So to conclude, we've got Mike Simpson, and Mike's going to talk about using synthetic data to improve object detection in machine learning. Thank you. Can you hear me? Right, good. Um, so, as I suspect most of you know, uh, which is useful because it cuts my introduction down quite a lot, um, machine learning is obviously a very useful and very powerful tool, but one of the biggest, well, not the biggest, certainly one of the major um, bottlenecks to machine learning is often the availability of training data, the, the data that you use to teach the machine what it is uh, you want it to do. Um, either the data isn't available or you have to go through the process of annotating that data which I know from personal experience is a long and tedious process and prone to human error. So what if you could generate that data? What if you could create artificial images and data to feed into your machine learning system in order to train it? That would obviously save you a lot of um, time and effort um, but the question is does it work? Can it actually be done and can it be um, used to produce uh, practical results? Uh, and this is one of the things that we were looking at on um, a project that I was recently uh, working on earlier this year. So just briefly, I'll go over the sort of background of the project that we were working on, um, the problem that I was brought in to try and solve uh, the solution that we developed, uh, some of the results from some early tests, and then where we plan to go uh, from, from what we've done so far. So... Just for some background information, we were part of a project called TRAC, which is a, one of these ridiculous academic uh, ac acronyms for a project name, but not the craziest I've ever worked on. Um, and the idea of this was it was a multidisciplinary project involving multiple institutions around the UK, um, various universities, we had transport operators, DFT, UKRI, various other partners uh, involved. And it was all about looking at particularly the spread of the uh, COVID-19 virus on um, public transport and what sort of things we can do to mitigate things and um, analyse things. And as part of that project, um, some colleagues were looking at analysing the existing CCTV footage that is already being captured on the vehicles to try and do two main things. One was to estimate vehicle utilisation, so how many passengers were uh, in the image and on the vehicle, and then to try and estimate whether those passages were observing social distancing rules. Um, they did this using Detectron 2 and a couple for, by Facebook research and a couple of the um, neural networks that are included on that, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, and the, the conclusion of their research is that it's not easy to do uh, <laughs> for various reasons. Um, so there are a couple of things that we can't do much about. So we can't really control the data that we're getting from the CCTV footage. We can't improve the quality of the CCTV footage. We can't change the fact that the cameras are put in really dumb places so you can't actually see all the passengers on the vehicle. There's not a lot that we can do about that. And you can see this image shows you sort of some of the problems of trying to work out what's a person and what isn't when there are handrails and text and various other things getting in the way. I say there's not much that we can do about that because that's the data that we are getting um, from the transport operators. But we still thought it might be possible to improve the accuracy of the models that we developed to try and um, analyse the number of passengers on the vehicle. Um, and we thought one way of doing it, so one problem was the availability of data. So we had, we were given access to some CCTV footage captured during the pandemic, but we only had a limited number of vehicle um, uh, footage that we were, videos that we were allowed to use. Uh, and so that means even if we did manually annotate them ourselves, um, we didn't have a lot of training data available. And we thought, and uh, yeah, another thing, of course, that we have to consider is privacy. So we were only allowed to use footage that had been anonymized. So people's faces have been blurred out. And as I think you can see in some of these images, some of the text has been blurred out. So you don't know exactly the time and date that the images were captured. And the question that I was brought on to try and answer is, can we do something about this? Can we uh, try and address this in some way? And so, thank you for explaining what Blender is. That also saves me some time. Um, <laughs> the solution that we uh, tried to develop involved using Blender, this open source uh, 3D creation suite, to generate the images and code to generate the data to then feed into the machine learning tool to see whether that could be used to improve 
the results. Uh, the advantage of this approach is that we can control things so we know where the people are in the scene because we put them there. Um, we can control where the passengers are put and various other variables. Uh, we also know how far apart they are so again we can use that information to train the machine learning systems uh, and so we can generate as much images and data as we need automatically and they're made up people so we don't have to worry about them suing us over GDPR. So. On paper, it sounds like a really good solution, but the question that we were trying to answer in this particular piece of research was A, are the images that we generate you know, realistic enough, useful enough, can you use them to train a machine learning model? And what effect does that have when you then apply the machine learning model to uh, real-world CCTV footage? So the way that the system works, we built a 3D model of the bus, so this is based on a, a real-world vehicle. Um, built in Blender, we create the empty bus, it's got seats and it's got handrails and all sorts of other features. We've got um, realistic-ish glass shaders on the window so we get reflections, which is one of the things that we were trying to um, eliminate as false positives and various other um, elements to try and make the image as realistic as possible to some degree. Um, and then in addition to the visible objects that appear in the render, we have these invisible objects, so we've got uh, basically attachment points on all the seats where we can put our seated passengers. The red areas in the aisle are for placing standing passengers on board the vehicle and then we have some areas on, depending on the model, outside the vehicle where we can place pedestrians because again one of the things we want to eliminate is false positives of passengers being um, identified as pedestrians being identified as passengers falsely as I've just done. Um, and then we uh, take that 3D model and we run um, some Python code uh, to populate the image. We've got a number of variables that we can control. We've got the number of passengers, their location, their height, we've got all the material colours, uh, lighting settings, all sorts of things that we can uh, randomise uh, and adjust. And the result, uh, at least for this early stage, has been images like this. Now these are low quality character models. Um, partly to help optimise the process, but also because we wanted to test whether the system works before we went to the expense of getting expensive, um, realistic um, 3D character models. So these are examples of some of the images that we can create, which have got some extra features like pedestrians walking on the street outside and trees and other things to cast shadows uh, and affect the lighting. And so we end up ultimately with images like these. So these were created with a relatively low resolution and sample rate in order to match the quality of the CCTV footage that we're working on and also so that we could generate and render as many uh, images as possible uh, in a short space of time. And then in addition to the images we also, because we know where the passengers are, we can create uh, bounding boxes and other data which we export along with the image and here I used, I can't remember the name of the tool, but I used a third party tool to overlay the generated data just to sanity check to make sure that the bounding boxes look sensible. Um, and that data is then combined into Cocoa format which can then mean the images and the data can be imported directly into uh, the machine learning model for training. Before I look at the results, whether or not this actually works, um, I just wanted to give you an overview of some stats. So we can generate 10,000 images in around 12 hours. Um, that Cocoa data post-processing step takes less than a minute. Training the machine learning with 10,000 images takes about an hour and then running inference on 1,000 images with that trained model takes about five minutes usually. Um, so although the images are fairly low quality and not necessarily photorealistic, um, <laughs> we can uh, potentially, you could leave your desk at five o'clock, set this thick running and come back the following morning and have um, all of the data uh, ready to go analysis. Um, so we were only able to do some very limited uh, testing with this uh, and the way that we decided to evaluate it was to use the um, neural networks that were available as part of the Detectron 2 library. We tested them sort of out of the box without any additional training to see how accurate they were when applied to either synthetic images or uh, CCTV footage. Then we trained the machine learning model with the addition of this synthetic data uh, and then we compared the results of the trained uh, and untrained models to see what sort of improvement in results um, the training had produced. Yes. 
So the first data set was done using purely synthetic models. So we generated 50,000 images. Uh, we split them into batches so where we had 40,000 images for training and 10,000 images for evaluation. And these results are the um, average across all of those batches. Uh, and some of the key results are, so we got a sort of um, increase of four and a half, yeah, four and a half percent uh, correct images. So that's where it est correctly estimated the number of passengers that were in the image. We see a reduction in the average error um, in the trained um, results of um, of round four. So it decreases from an error of around six to around two. Uh, we also see reductions in things like the maximum and standard deviation of the error, which sort of all suggests that there is some uh, improvement in um, the accuracy and consistency. And more importantly, this experiment proved that we can generate the images in the right format, train the machine learning model with them, and it does uh, produce uh, improved results when you apply the trained model to other synthetic images. So that was good. That was our first step. Um, oh yeah, interestingly, one of the things that we noticed was that with the um, with the training, the results actually got slightly worse when there were fewer passengers on the bus, which does suggest that it's not ideal for this original intended purpose of evaluating passengers during a pandemic, where the passengers are very few uh, and spread out. Um, but you can see the difference between the untrained in dark blue and trained in light blue. As the pas number of passengers on the bus increases, the um, decrease in error uh, is much more dramatic, which we think means it can be uh, more useful for um, sort of normal operation when buses are um, more full of passengers, so it might still have some use. Um, one of the other things that we can do with this data, because we know things like the intensity of the sun and whether the lights on the vehicle were on, we can evaluate that data too. So if we notice, um, I was hoping to show you the Power BI reports, but I can't, I can't get it to work. Um, with the internal lights on, the results are slightly better than with the lights off. Uh, and the brighter the sun is, obviously, the more washed out the image is, and so um, the uh, less accurate it is. So we've got the option to explore uh, the data in that way as well. Uh, then we came sort of the, the, the big test for us, which was to test the system on real-world CCTV footage. So we got hold of 11 videos, all about four minutes long, four frames per second, I believe, which is around 10,000 frames uh, of footage in total, all with a similar camera angle on, a, on the same vehicle type. Um, and again, we did this training with, um, evaluation with and without the training using the synthetic images that we generated before. And although the results aren't as dramatic an improvement as we saw with the synthetic images, we see an almost 4% improvement in the number of correct estimates. Uh, and 23% reduction in error, which sounds impressive, although it's a relatively minor um, error uh, in the first place. We were unfortunately limited by the, the CCTV footage that we had available, which was all a maximum of five passengers, all stuff captured during the pandemic, which was not ideal. Um, but again, we saw a reduction in the error, which is the difference between the estimate and the actual number of passengers that we know were on the bus. Um, and similarly, reduction in variance and standard deviation, which does suggest um, some improvement. So it's still very early doors. We, are hope we were hoping to get some more um, funding to take this further. I know it's um, we need to do a lot more tests with a, a much wider variety of data in order to prove that this actually works. Um, but the sort of initial conclusions of this work are that you know, it is possible to create this synthetic image using the 3D models uh, in Blender to use that, those images and data to train uh, a machine learning model uh, and that it does um, produce improvements in that model when you then uh, apply it to CCTV footage. So this technique might be uh, useful if we can spend some more time proving uh, that it actually works. So yes, I don't think we'll ever be good at doing this task, but I think we can be less bad at it. I think that's our main uh, takeaway from this. Um, in terms of where to take it next, so we're hoping to get our hands on some more CCTV footage to do some more extensive analysis um, and say, I am, <laughs> I hate to use this excuse at this conference, but I am only an RSE. <laughs> I'm not a machine learning expert. Um, uh, I sort of built the Blender and the Python code side of it. Um, I need to work more closely with machine learning experts who know how to do proper formal machine learning uh, experiments, but um, we're hoping to um, go on and do that uh, soon. 
Uh, and then we've been experimenting with some additional things like taking a rolling average over multiple frames uh, on the assumption that the number of people in the image doesn't change very often. So we can try and um, reduce uh, yeah, error caused by things like passengers going past, uh, pedestrians going past the window, uh, and reflections in the window, um, and that sort of thing by applying some domain knowledge. And then more long term, we've already done some experiments where we've recreated a, a London Underground train and we've got colleagues looking at um, London Underground train behaviour from CCTV footage and again we're hoping to marry that up and look at um, other vehicles and testing scenarios that we can um, test with this method and then we're also looking, there's a lot of interest in using these models as a sort of, I don't really like the term digital twin, but using these models to test what happens if you move the camera, can you put the camera in a more sensible location uh, and uh, produce improved results. We've also got some experiments that some colleagues uh, in the Urban Observatory are running with a real um, stereoscopic camera putting that on the bus, which we're hoping will make uh, estimating the number of people in the images and whether they are social distancing uh, much easier, although much less relevant these days than it was uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so yeah, that's sort of basically sort of looking at generating synthetic images and using them to train machine learning models and got some promising results um, in improving those models accuracy on CCTV footage and we think there's a lot of potential in this if we can get the funding to properly prove that it really actually works. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions in the room? Yes. So, kind of look, did you consider asking human objects to combine some of the CCTV things and use them as children? Yes, that was that was what they sort of were doing in the original um, experiments. Um, so they were they were trying to use manually annotated CCTV footage, and we used some manually annotated CCTV footage to evaluate the um, improvements. Um, so yeah, there, there was some work going on, but we were trying to augment that with the... Uh, okay. How did they compare this one? So synthetically generated as well as... Again, we don't yet have a formal comparison. There is a paper that my colleagues have written that has got more details of their work from before I took over, but I'll, I'll share that link. I'll put that in, because it's Google Slides, I'll put that link in the final slide so that you can read that if you want. Uh, Yes, hi. Okay. Um, sort of similar question, which is, uh, did you uh, have you tried mixing in some similarity to real data that has to be broken up? It seemed like they went through the Yes, in these experiments, we were, yes. I mean, we the reason why you went into the real data, to be degree of the It was partly the sort of limitations of the data that was available um, uh, for training, but no, we, we really should be doing the comparisons and um, working, combining them together. This was just a sort of first step. Yes, I just have a question. So I found, do you ever look at the way of measuring the complexity of your system? So I found that by um, Use ETA data at the start of the second school because you may not use ETA data at the start and then hard data at the end. The model can then learn to a little bit of using like the simulations, some way of trying to how difficult the simulation should be. It's not like it's just walking through things. Yeah, that is a good idea, but no, we haven't, haven't done that yet. No. Is there one more up? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the talk. I'm Sean Primae. Uh, how did you um, balance the synthetic data and the real data and the training data? Uh, so that, uh, the short answer is we didn't. We've um, we sort of tried to come up. With most of those uh, those variables that I mentioned earlier in this uh, data set were sort of completely randomised. We were planning on trying to collect some. Um, I know synthetic data is a proper term, and I haven't necessarily used it properly here. Um, we were hoping to get hold of some sort of passenger data and passenger behavioural data that we could use to then weigh those random variables to try and produce more realistic results, but we, we just haven't had time so far. Um, 
which I think sort partly answers that first question. So it is, at the moment, it is completely random, but we are hoping to um, improve the model based once we've got more sort of passenger behavior data that we can use uh, to to improve that. And no, so the we use a, a really, really low sample rate when we're rendering the images out, which is partly what makes them um, produce them so quickly. And you do get some noise in the image. We, we'll use sort of minimal, rather than adding noise, we use minimal noise reduction. Um, but no, we haven't yet experimented with um, adding additional noise or sort of artifacts to the image, because you get some weird artifacts in some of the images, which we should probably try and recreate as well. Uh, and again, yeah, we haven't done um, overlaying of text yet, but that's something that we could relatively easily do. Uh, yep, one you think the model will be sensitive to where the camera's placed? Say you, you generated your data in Blender with the camera somewhere, you had to go quite right to where the camera was in the real books. You know, do you think moving around where you um, took your Blender images, would the model still work, do you think, or do you think it would be like rubbish if the camera wasn't in the map? That is a good question. Um, I'm not sure. The, so the we we sort of the image the footage that we were given, as I say, was all from the same vehicle type, and the camera was in roughly the same place. Although one of the other annoyances and part of this problem is that the camera, even on the same model of bus, isn't necessarily always in the same place. So we do need to do some more training with and you know experimenting with moving the camera around a to see if we can improve the results and inform policy on where they put cameras in the future, but also yeah to try and model some of the existing. Um, yeah. yeah, so if you were redesigning it, it's probably useful for it. Then you can get the stock table. Uh, yeah, that would, that would be easy. Um, or uh, we, we, the, we've got some high, quite high hopes for the stereoscopic stuff that we're, we're doing at the moment. Um, hopefully, we should be able to recreate those cameras in Blender and see if we can match their results as well. Yep. This is actually a uh, no, so I have used Blender in a couple of projects before. We've done quite a few um, data visualizations. Uh, one particular project where we had a 3D model of the city and we were trying to overlay it with data from, we've got the Open Observatory here and they've got hundreds of sensors all over the city monitoring rainfall and air quality and we were trying to tell interesting data stories. Um, so um, I've been using Blender since that, and then we've done a few other. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. So the donut tutorial. Sorry. Donut tutorial. Yeah. Yeah. There's 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 an infamous guy who made this like 16 part. 20 hour long tutorial on how to render a photorealistic donut in Blender, but it is actually that that's how I learned. That's a really good way of um, learning. Yeah. But yeah, it's a fairly steep learning curve. But once you do get into it, it, you know, you can do pretty much anything that you can do through the interface, you can do through the API. The API is really good. Um, okay. Thanks again, Mike.